on a budget four times the size of the first Bond film, Doctor No, and with a writing duo who finally nailed the James Bond big screen blueprint, Goldfinger was the title that welcomed this cinematic series to the Super League. I'm Stephen Archibald, and welcome to my movie podcast. Welcome to my podcast, They Came From Within, Cult Movie Reviews. Solid Gold, Easy Action. Goldfinger, 1964. Goldfinger is, indubitably, one of the greatest bomb flicks of them all. What's most remarkable is that it made several improvements on Ian Fleming's 1959 novel, the seventh in the series, The source novel has strong characters and we are given more access to James Bond's thoughts and feelings than in any other Fleming book about the killer agent. However, the book's storyline doesn't sprint from beginning to end and it has a few implausibilities and inconsistencies. Screenwriters Richard Maybaum and Paul Dane did a terrific job ironing out these problems, whilst essentially keeping the original story intact. 007 is given the assignment of keeping an eye on the German gold magnate Ulrich Goldfinger, who suspected of gold smuggling. Bond is soon caught up in an elaborate, highly dangerous scheme known as Operation Grand Slam, one which involves irradiating the gold stored in Fort Knox, so as to massively increase the value of Goldfinger's own bullion supply and to destabilise the US economy to the benefit of the Chinese. Fears of economic instability, eh? This really is a film for our times. Unlike the previous two pictures, Goldfinger was not directed by Terence Young. He would return for a third and final time On the next one, Thunderball. Guy Hamilton took the directorial post on Goldfinger and he would go on to also direct Diamonds Are Forever, Live and Let Die and The Man with the Golden Gun. To date, Hamilton's the only man to direct four Bond movies. In fact, he had been asked to helm Dr. No but turned it down. Guy was already familiar with Ian Fleming due to their naval intelligence days during World War II. Pussy Galore, the Bond woman with the most outlandish, most celebrated name in the whole series. Ulrich's head pilot from a team of all female pilots. The striking British actress Honor Blackman was picked by the producers for this role. It helped that she was a real-life judo practitioner. Cubby Broccoli was impressed by Honor's talents on the wonderful TV series The Avengers, which had not been shown in the United States at this stage. So, her familiarity would delight UK audiences, whereas her novelty value would appeal to our US cousins over the pond. As expected, Honor gave a memorable performance. One of the improvements the writers May Baum and Dane made to Fleming's original story was to make Pussy's romantic liaison with Bond at the end of the picture far more credible. In the novel, she's a lesbian who eventually succumbs to James Bond's magnetic charms. Even most readers in the late 1950s would have found this a crude depiction of the erroneous belief that it only takes a good man to turn a gay woman straight. In the movie, they depict Pussy Galore as a tomboy, but one who radiates a womanly sexuality, 
making her coupling with 007 far more believable. Another great improvement on the Source novel concerns Auric Goldfinger's personal assistant, Jill Masterson. Played by the stunning blonde actress Shirley Eaton, Jill's the unfortunate lady who's killed by a furious Goldfinger after she spends the night with Bond. It's no ordinary demise for her. She dies from suffocation after being covered from head to toe in gold paint. In the book, Bond only gets to hear about her death sometime later. In the movie, however, he's the one who discovers Jill's glowing corpse. It's a breathtaking reveal on first viewing and such an iconic image. What's also better handled in the movie is the torture sequence, where Bond is strapped to a table and a laser beam is threatening to emasculate this womanizing agent before rendering him in two. The torture method used in the book is far less imaginative. The beautiful model, Tanya Mallet, appears in the film as Tilly Masterson, Jill's younger sister who swears to avenge her murder. Tanya had auditioned for the role of Tatiana Romanova in the previous bomb flick from Russia with Love, losing out to Daniela Bianchi. Tanya's quite pleasing in the role of Tilly Masterson. Unfortunately, she quickly grew disillusioned with acting. And apart from appearing briefly in a 1976 episode of The New Avengers, entitled The Midas Touch, she never acted again. The wonderful Helen Mirren is Tanya's cousin, and it's said they grew up together. Sadly, Tanya passed away on the 30th of March 2019, at the age of 77. Tanya Mallet isn't the only beauty from this film the world has lost in recent years. Honor Blackman died at the age of 94 on the 5th of April 2020, just six months before the death of the great Sean Connery, and the voluptuous Margaret Nolan died in the same month as Sean, on the 5th of October 2020 to be precise. She was 76 years old. Margaret, who appeared in six Carry On films, most notably Carry On Girls from 1973, plays Dink in Goldfinger, Bond's masseuse during the sequence set in Miami. It was a near-naked Margaret who posed for the opening credits, as scenes from the previous Bond movies were projected onto her body. She also posed in gold-coloured skin paint for the ad campaign. Orson Welles was originally set to play Auric Goldfinger, but he priced himself out of the job. The producers were bowled over by the performance Gert Frober gave in a 1958 German language film called It Happened in Broad Daylight, where he portrayed a serial killer of children, whereas it was the director Guy Hamilton who spotted Harold Sakata on a wrestling TV programme. The Korean Olympic weightlifting silver medalist was perfect for the part of Odd Job, Goldfinger's bowler hatted henchman, arguably the most memorable of all the Bond villain sidekicks. The movie's cracking theme tune was performed by the Welsh diva Shirley Bassey, a song penned by Anthony Newley and Leslie Brickus. Up until now, Shirley's the only recording artist to sing on three different Bond theme tunes. She followed Goldfinger with Diamonds Are Forever and Moonraker. And John Barry's brassy, sassy music score is simply outstanding. Goldfinger was the first Bond movie to win an Oscar. Norman Wonnerstall picked up the distinctive statuette for best sound effects. 
Albertar Broccoli and Harry Saltzman produced the movie for Eon Productions. And the movie was promoted and distributed by United Artists. Filming took place between the 20th of January and the 11th of July 1964. The UK, the US and Switzerland were the countries used for shooting. Goldfinger received its premiere at the Odeon Leicester Square on the 17th of September 1964. I know it's a terrible pun, but I really have to say it's a golden oldie. I'm Stephen Archibald, and thank you very much for listening to my podcast. They came from within cult movie reviews. YouTube and Facebook listeners can find more of my podcasts via various podcast outlets. And online, please feel free to like, follow, or subscribe. Thank you very much once again. Take good care of yourself, and bye-bye.